that have been less than easy. Surveys about juggling homeschooling with work showed the challenge fell disproportionately on mums. Then there was and still is the problem of negotiating time at the uh, kitchen table or dealing with dodgy internet connections when the IT team is more than just a corridor away. Well, despite those pros and cons, it seems that even when the government uh, wants to, wanted us to go back to the office, few of us actually wanted to. While 84% of French workers returned to the office this September, in the UK, only 40% of us did. So does this reflect something particular about the nature of work in Britain or about our responses to the pandemic? Does the acceptance of working from home as part of the new normal reveal to us that this was actually part of an inevitable trend? Or does it represent something of a reluctance to return and embrace a more sociable existence? I've got so many questions, um, but I'm sure our speakers will help us to unpick those a little bit. Uh, before I introduce them, just to let you know that at the Academy of Ideas, we haven't furloughed our staff. We've continued to work, a lot of it online, of course, throughout the pandemic. But obviously, these events aren't cheap to produce, and we would welcome any contributions to the Academy you're able to make. And I think my colleague Rob has just popped a link uh, in the chat so you can see where you can do that. Okay, our first speaker this evening is Professor James Woodhausen. James is a visiting professor at London South Bank University and an author and co-author of several books. After James, we'll hear from Para Mullen, who is a fellow at the Chartered Institute of Personnel and Development and a regular speaker at our Battle of Ideas Festival. We will then hear from Adam Gary, who is an historian, journalist, a political and current affairs broadcaster. And finally, we will hear from Dave Clements, who's a local government advisor and a chair of this uh, social policy forum. Okay, so over to you, James, and I believe you've got a slide presentation to share with us. Here we go, folks. Well, uh, much of the discussion on the future of working from home is economic. It's got its place. I'm going to turn to a bit of sociology today. Um, so uh, I can advance it. Um, Right, and so a lot of people think that this is the future. Uh, a lot of people, including some Dutch people like me, think this is the future. Um, but in the course of sociology, I'm going to draw upon Frank Ferretti's new book about borders to give a very different take on the office for the future. A couple of premises. Uh, workers never really had privacy in the office from its inception. And all the baloney about empowerment hasn't done much for them. But uh, it's not just an economic question. It's also a question, among many others, of supervision in the office. Talking about the office before we get to working from home. And the basic thesis I have is that after the 70s, really, the old style open plan office, open and denied privacy, became the landscaped, more home-like, fluid, porous, amorphous, status-conscious, borderless office, blamange in a word, where managers like to display themselves in a way they'd been a bit more secretive before, that we all had to go on compulsory play uh, expeditions satirized by uh, the series, The Office, and then we, if we didn't have a dress down Friday, we might have a working from home Friday. So the office has changed rather slowly. And we're all familiar with the new stuff, but 50 years ago, it was rather different. Why should we uh, upheld, uphold the private realm in this development? Because it looks attractive with no tie, but it also moves the whole dialogue away from wealth production or learning or those sorts of things into a kind of lifestyle consumerized uh, phenomenon which is not what work is about and may do something to explain our low productivity. Now we uh, need to uphold the private realm because whatever its defects uh, it's where we think, judge, reflect and are grown up. Uh, in a conscious and autonomous way. And we have to believe that people, even in the home, which has its backwardness, 
can behave like that. Briefly, historically, the office was always beginning with the railroad in the States, really, and the telegraph, Samuel Morse here. So the office is not an independent entity. Its whole inception was connected with the outside world. And the second thing about it was, from 1890, American offices started adopting these machines by this man. And the big uh, breakthrough was in 1890, when those machines, financed by the state, helped run the 1890 census. So the state bureaucracy was an important source of offices and office innovation. Indeed, the great systematizer Melvin Dewey, who uh, gave the Dewey system its name in libraries, uh, now, of course, um, stigmatized for doing all the wrong things um, back in the day, in the late 19th century, he exported uh, with the state libraries behind him um, all of the basic office equipment over to Europe. So the American state was important in this. Why am I saying that? Because there was an intense use of the office to try to impose order when the Old West had died and the uh, New West was not properly established. It was a period of turmoil and the office was an attempt to try to assume some control over that uh, on a continental scale, beginning with the railroad. So it was about order, it was about discipline. Uh, and Dewey's own career, not just in the office, but also in the home, showed that this uh, search for order and urge to systematize um, was really quite a powerful thing. I'm not gonna go into that. Now, when you turn back to the office, you can see the first open plan office, 1906, the Larkin building, and it's all about supervision. It's about female typists and male clerks. And really the situation there was closed door cellular offices with walls up the top and often above the workers in every sense of the word, no privacy for the people below. All of this, ladies and gentlemen, began before Taylor inspected the fa uh, factory to try to systematize it well before this kind of um, scenario came to the public eye much later in the movies. And the office was always a zone for surveillance, uh, like the assembly line in many ways, but it uh, preceded the assembly line. It moved more slowly technologically, but it was also very important. You take the assembly line in 19. Uh, 40, um, by that time, you'd had the Johnson Wax building, uh, also designed by Frank Lloyd Wright, like the Larkin building, and the number of people employed in the States by offices was bigger than that employed in the assembly line. So that's the inception of the, of the office. Now, a lovely designer in the uh, 45 started mixing up home decor with office decor. And that already confirmed that there was something going on between the two, two milieu, not for a long time, but we'll see. Now, in the apartment, 1960, you can see that people are already mobile working a bit, but it's regimented, it's strict, it's linear. But something else had happened just before then in Europe with social democracy, just northwest of Hamburg in Quickbourne. A suburb there. They invented the landscape office at the peak of the Cold War. There it is. And that meant offices that were more like this, ladies and gentlemen, not so boxy, more informal, more fluid, including, notice in 58, a rather expensive piece of home office furniture by George Nelson from the Second World War. And here he is fanning out across the 60s with Herman Miller desks that referred to systems furniture designed with him and Robert Proch. And they indicated that something else was happening now, that the interior could be still supervised from above. You can see it there, but it was a bit more personal. There were cubicles because you're in America, they're strong on privacy, but it was more modular. It was more personal. It was more open quite obviously. Uh, and it made for a more borderless office, more porous. And the key thing at the moment was it was sociological era after the purely economic one, where it was important for status reasons to get the corner office. 
key development one minute, in all James. of this. How much? One, one minute. Min one well, minute. I just want to say that the key development in all of this was the space race and the rise of project teams. That made for a new kind of openness and display of yourself in the Cold War office. And there were more teams, bigger teams, more peripatetic teams as globalization uh, increased. And uh, with that, those phenomena, team display of your emotions became inevitable and managers being strung out all over the world, nevertheless had to be on the shop floor with their workers more. So what I'm going to say if I'd had the time is that working from home needs to be situated in this context where the diminution of the private realm had already begun with the open office and all the subsequent developments, hot desking, hot bunking, hoteling, flexible work and all of that and working from home are, should be viewed in the context, not conspiratorial, of a continual and increasing subordination of the private realm to the public realm. The private realm is important to defend and whatever the productivity defects of the home, and they are many, the ability for it not to become living at work, for neighbors not to view your home as an office, which is a public place, for that kind of blurring, we have to stand out against that while retaining, as Adam says, the right for people to work where they like, we have to guard against further incursions through working from home of the private realm. Okay, James, thank you very, very much. And um, in a moment, if technology allows, we will uh, see Para. Okay, um, so thank you, Mo. Uh, hey, everyone, you can hear me, can't you? Yes. Um, some people are discussing working from home as a change catalyst by the pandemic, but of course, it is not a new phenomenon. Also not new is that the discussion about working from home has reframed some long running work themes that have been preoccupying employers, employees and HR professionals. I'll discuss three of these. First, well-being and mental health. Second, the blurring of the public private divide specifically the separation between people's working and personal lives. And third, concerns about employee engagement. Big contentious subjects in themselves, but here I will only look at whether more working from home could either ease or aggravate them. So first, well-being and mental health. I think a lot of this pre-pandemic discussion, unfortunately, exaggerated people's vulnerability to normal workplace pressures and reinforced it. But now with continued working from home, mental well-being could be under greater strain. You might think that with no stressful commuting, more time for listening to birdsong and relief from having to spend face-to-face -face physical time with difficult managers, employees would be happier and some certainly are. That is the upside. The downside, many working parents having to juggle childcare, cope with cramped space, flaky internet connections, and worry not just about catching COVID, but the prospect of redundancies and greater financial ahead, hardship ahead. So you can see if you were in the office, Someone will pick up on these anxieties from your body language and offer a listening ear. None of that is available when you're working in isolation at home. There's also more potential for paranoia with working, uh, remote working. You might wonder why someone has not answered your email, worry about not having got your point across, or even listened to during a Zoom call. Again, if you were in the office and you felt uneasy about anything, you could share things with colleagues informally. Overall, working from home is more likely to aggravate than alleviate our work anxieties. Second, the problems arising from the blurring between public and private life. Pre-pandemic, enhanced technology has enabled some bosses 
to expect their employees to respond to emails well beyond the working day. That was bad enough. But now with the location of work physically inside your home, the fusion of working and home life has moved to a higher level, both space and time-wise. Not only can this corrode your domestic family relationships, but being interrupted by your kids when you're supposed to be working is no longer an amusing Zoom occasion. It is bound to impair anyone's ability to focus on their work task, which then kind of generates a vicious circle. You don't think you've done enough during your normal working day, so you work into the evenings and the weekends to compensate further invading your personal space and time. I fear if working from home became more normal, we would lose even more of our personal time as well as our privacy from the intrusion of our bosses. Third, employee engagement. Managers fret over this all the time. How can we keep employees motivated on their work? How do you reduce high attrition rates from people being disengaged? To what extent does a lack of employee engagement contribute to weak productivity growth? This discussion links to the broader business obsession with purpose. Every organization is into mission statements and defining what their purpose is. Business leaders are keen to create a company corporate culture, which all are bought into. Yet, more working from home is likely to make it more difficult to retain company culture. Long-term employees might be able to display it for a few months of isolation, but it is a challenge inducting new recruits. How do you do it when so much is carried out virtually? How do you transfer learning especially in the soft skills that you adopt when you watch colleagues and can ask for snippets of advice, something I would argue email, Slack and Zoom are poor substitutes. An office environment allows you not just to work collaboratively together, but also having a bit of fun with your workmates. In an office with other workers, you have a sense of togetherness Balloons get put up on someone's birthday, cakes are brought in, there's buzz and chatter, even the moaning about certain customers and much letting off steam. All this sharing together doesn't just help us get through the day, but it helps motivate our work and achieve better results, even when sometimes we're not sure about the purpose of what we are doing. To conclude, Greater working from home has the potential to fragment employee experience, undermine trust and workplace culture. It is not the same as being in the office, grabbing someone for a quick chat, exchanging a word with more experienced fellow workers in the lift and feeling good in yourself that you have made direct contact. Laugh if you want. But if working for home were to become the new normal, as one of um, the uh, article authors said, Kevin McCulloch, I think, wrote on LinkedIn, be careful what you wish for. That's it. Thank you very much, Para. That was uh, very enjoyable. Lots of uh, points to draw on there. Um, so next, we will uh, bring up Adam Gary. Adam? Good evening, everyone. Well, I could well imagine that someone could make a very persuasive and even partly true case that society was better before Gutenberg's invention of the printing press. Of course, the vested interests of the time, we had big church then rather than big state, were very much worried by the idea that people could read the Bible for themselves and choose to worship in the way that they did. But it wasn't the printing press that created the Protestant Reformation in Western and Central Europe. It was human nature. 
And it's human nature that is always independent from technology. Indeed, if there was any lesson to be learned from Shelley's Frankenstein, it's not that technology can run amok, but that if we use technology to play God, we get into trouble. That, however, is not what technology does by itself, and it's not what most people are capable of doing by themselves or in groups, even if they wanted to. The fault in that lies in government, and the bigger the government, the bigger the mistakes. That's why when we talk about this work from home revolution, I think we've got to divorce it, absurd though it might seem, from the whole corona, what I call corona authoritarianism, this lockdown. The technology that enabled us to work at home so successfully during this crisis existed long before the disease was even discovered. In fact, it's been going on for round about 10 years. Many people have already been doing it, many of them very happy, and they were doing it in circumstances that were much more favorable to a social lifestyle than the lockdown. To put it in other words, if working from home is as popular as it is during a time where you can't go to the pub afterwards, can't go to a restaurant, can't get away from the children during school, hours so that they've got a space to work during the day at school and you've got a place to work in front of your little computers and tablets and all the rest of it at home. The problems that we are seeing are a result of government compulsion rather than the result of some people deciding to use technology to make their lives easier. And when I say some people, I mean quite a lot. There was a very recent study, a joint study by the universities in Southampton and Cardiff that said 90% of the people surveyed preferred the working at home lifestyle. Other similar surveys from the United States have come up with the same. And this, again, it's under the most unhuman, inhuman, and inhumane circumstances that one can imagine. I, for one, was against the government ordering people out of the workplace in March of this year, and I was equally against the government attempting to bully people back into the workplace in August. Now that's all up in the air again. People ought to have free choice, and it's the concept of freedom, this idea of liberty, which will allow people to choose whether they want to work from home or whether they want to go into an office, just as sure as whilst the printing press certainly helped Protestant people to spread their beliefs, it didn't result in the disappearance of Catholicism. It still, of course, exists today, and the office will exist tomorrow, even though the, there will be different denominations, so to speak, of work. I think that these new changes in terms of the sudden discovery of the, of the ability to work at home, which has nothing to do with this crisis since the technology and our ability to use it was pre-existing, it's going to even be good for the people who are opposed to working from home. Because if nine out of 10 people want to work from home, companies that insist on people working in the office will have a smaller workforce to draw from. This will mean bigger salaries for the people that actually want to go into the office. So in this sense, if we let liberty run its course, if we let all of us decide what's best for us and our friends and our family, rather than Commissar Hancock and Supreme Leader Johnson, it will give everyone the best of their own of their own worlds. Now there's another issue which is going to be the great catastrophe of the next decade. We're going to witness a tragic and perfect storm, perfectly tragic storm, if you will, of unemployment, the likes of which we've not seen since the 1930s. And this is going to be combined with a housing crisis, the likes that wasn't there in the 1930s. Working from home is one of several things and indeed it is the easiest thing that can be done to at least try to somewhat palliate this coming disaster. As people do vote with their feet, and I believe they'll continue to do so in terms of working from home, we will see derelict office buildings in city centers. It's very easy to turn these into affordable and sustainable housing. In fact, long before the work from home revolution, when heavy and even light industry started leaving big cities, you see factories in places like Clerkenwell and Shoreditch in East London turned into residential homes all throughout the big cities of the United States. There's the loft revolution where factories and storehouses are becoming housing. We're desperate for more housing and this 
offers us a way out of this terrible trap that we've let ourselves get into by foolish monetary policy, foolish migration policy, and many other foolish policies, including the over-centralization of work. The, there are many good arguments to be made about why work from home is antisocial, but one could make equally, in fact, maybe even stronger arguments that the way the office has evolved has become increasingly antisocial. If people were allowed to conserve their time, energy, and indeed money by working at home, and the world opens up as it should have been opened up months and months ago, if not for this mad authoritarian government, we could see that people could slip out of their home at five o'clock, meet the neighbor, whether it's a young man or an old man, a young woman, an old woman, go down the pub, go to the local theater, support the arts. And this is another thing that I think is important. There are certainly some professions, some trades that cannot work from home, the creative sector being one that's close to my heart and being a very strong example of this. I think it would be absolutely wonderful if some of these faceless gray offices with the buzzing fluorescent lighting could be swapped out for theater spaces, for live music spaces, the kind of which have been driven out of many big cities, London in particular, because of crippling government regulations and government saying, instead of liberty of property for all, we're going to listen to the developers because they line our pockets and say, screw you to the small business owners, the most discriminated group of people in the land who want to run a music venue, a music pub or a theater. 30 seconds, Adam. So to, to wrap things up, let's not blame technology for allowing us to do things that many of us want to do. Let's blame government for failing to do this gradually, failing to incentivize people through tax breaks and cuts to regulation to put homes in city centers rather than these faceless offices. But let's also not be bullied. If people want to go into the office, I'm not going to stop them, but the government already is. Thank you very much. Um, lots more to think about there. Very well presented. Um, Dave. Thank you, Mo. Um, OK, tonight's uh, social policy forum debate uh, continues on from our last discussion, uh, which was also on the theme of work, uh, about frontline workers uh, who tend, uh, by definition, uh, not to work from home. Uh, this is something we should perhaps remember um, as part of this discussion. Uh, as somebody, I think it was Michael, commented uh, while Adam was speaking. The, the policy implications of working from home during lockdown um, and its projected impacts uh, over the future are considerable. For some of us, the recent experience of providing childcare and homeschooling for kids uh, touched on by Mo and Para, uh, while also working from home has a particular resonance. There are broader and bigger points to make. Uh, some are keen to stress the potentially positive impacts of working from home. Uh, with localities levelled up as people's uh, commute uh, lessons. Uh, others say there will be a levelling down of wages as proximity to the office uh, comes to matter less. There are debates also to be had on the impact on communities, on high streets, city centres, jobs uh, and the wider economy. But for the moment I want to take a step back and ask why has the discussion become so individualised? What does the uh, working from home experience tell us about our attitude to work today and also about the coercive nature of what has brought us uh, to this point. I think there's a, a me, me, me element to this working from home uh, discussion. Whether you're for or against it, it centers a lot around whether it is good or bad for you personally. Is your work sufficiently flexible? Do you have an acceptable work-life balance? There's rather less said about what the implications might be for society at large. Here, I think James is onto something uh, with the shift from wealth, productivity and order that he spoke about to work as a lifestyle. Well-being as a matter of concern for employers has been around for a while and it can be as intrusive as it is welcome. What you might want support with mental health difficulties during lockdown, the confidence perhaps of the isolation, paranoia and worry of the hardships to come. Spoke about, you may be less keen on observing your employer's no smoking pot uh, while in your own home. Again, this echoes what James says about the downside of the uh, post 70s borderless, fluid, or porous office, and what Paris says about the breaking down of the uh, public uh, private divide. 
this um, double-edged sword of a relationship with employers is built on a sense of employees being fragile and vulnerable and in need of, and in need of support if they're to carry out their roles effectively. There's also a strong element of fear and perceived fragility and angst over the supposed threat posed by the virus, largely as a consequence of the government and its advisors telling us that we should be afraid. An approach that has undermined its stuttering attempts to get at least some of us back to the office. Some are genuinely afraid of getting on the tube. Some just don't want to go back. For others, though, perhaps work has lost much of its meaning. At least so much as they're not willing to take the risk of returning to their hastily abandoned, now anti-socially distanced offices. Working from home has the potential to, to still further alienate people from each other. We're already learning to um, see each other as potential super spreaders to be avoided, rather than as family, friends, fellow citizens, and indeed as colleagues in whom we can trust, work alongside, and have a sense of solidarity with. And working from home can only sharpen, sharpen the division too between those who have to go to work, in inverted commas, for instance, being in the front line as bin men, bus drivers, or shelf stackers, and those supporting their local high streets with their laptops and their lattes. But also, to some degree, between those like the doctors, nurses, and care workers that many of us were quite literally applauding as our heroes and heroines every week at the height of the pandemic, and the seeming reluctance of the teachers, or at least their union reps, to allow them to return to school. And also GPs apparently wish to work from home, at least some of them, um, conducting, their consult conducting their consultations over the phone, rather than reopening their practices and actually seeing their patients, who are now that bit more likely to need their advice. While some can work at home without much consequence, given the nature of their work or their need for solitude, this is not in any way typical. Most of us need the sociality of an office, at least some of the time, as Paro described so well, for our own sanity, uh, if nothing else. For those working in the public service capacity, in local authorities, for instance, that one-to-one -one relationship with clients or the communities they serve can be all important. Any reluctance from them to get back there is a particular concern. Nobody, except for the far fewer that were already doing it, chose to work from home in March. They were told to. Along with social distancing, mandatory masks, the rule of six, and everything else this government has introduced ostensibly in an effort to halt this virus, those of us that could were compelled to work from home, as Adam rightly said. The cumulative effect of these measures might make our home comparative oases, but the order to work from home was an integral part of the government's lockdown strategy what Adam described as the uh, corona-authoritarian corona strategy, um, a wholly liberal and it would seem foolhardy attempt to shut us away from the virus. Draconian laws have been introduced effectively by diktat, sometimes literally overnight without debate or opposition, and largely without the knowledge of the public. Is a little greater flexibility over where we work really worth all of that? Indeed, what can flexibility or indeed balance really mean when we're living under such unprecedented restraints on our day-to-day -day lives? So for all this, I should perhaps own up and admit that I work when I am working from home myself. Did I choose to do this? Not really. I was made redundant and then became a consultant. And so working from home uh, came in the territory, but still I've grown to rather like it. I may even prefer it. But my personal preference for anybody else's is hardly the point. Not only do we have little choice in the matter in these strange and disturbing times, the debate, like society itself, is already too individualized and too personal to help One us to make minute, sense. One minute, Dave. I think if we're to derive any positives from this experience, we need to look at the bigger picture. We might have a conversation, for instance, about what we want our collective futures to look like. And through the better organization of our working lives and through the right interventions in the economy, work out how we might go about achieving that. I think that working from home will no doubt have a small part to play. Thank you very, very much. Um, so quite a range of perspectives there, quite um, broad. We have focused quite a lot. I think Dave brought in things like GPs working from home, but also we've heard about banks shifting online, 
civil courts even, uh, notaries, it's not just the kind of standard office um, that, that is moving to work and from home. And of course, a few people have raised the point that not everybody can work from home. And we wonder if this creates a kind of two-tier society with those who have to go out and those who, who can stay home. So uh, quite a lot to get our, uh, get our heads around there. Got quite a few... Uh, raised hands so I'll just go straight out to the audience actually what I'll do is I'll take a few questions and then we'll come back to uh, the panel uh, to, to kind of respond to as many as they can if you are speaking could you unmute yourself because unfortunately it doesn't seem to want to let me this evening and if you can and you're willing to put your camera on it's just much nicer to see who we're speaking to so um, Sally yeah so the first thing is um, has have the changes that have already taken place in the workplace, such as hot desking, um, been the pr a prime example that I can think of, which means that you don't have a place at work of your own anymore. Has that then uh, fed into this idea of working from home or work? It's just what's the point in going to work to the workplace? Um, so I think that there's some trends. Also, uh, I think what Para was saying about a sense of belonging to your work and ownership of your work for your work um, has already gone. And I think that's what's contributed to this uh, lack of desire uh, to actually go back into the workplace, which is quite phenomenal, really. Um, so that's okay. one thing. The other thing I just wanted to say was, uh, one of my concerns is what happens to the next generation of workers. And I think that we've given up. I think the fact that we're all happy to work from home shows that we really don't worry about socialising a new generation of workers and that our employers are viewing um, the current situation as a stasis situation. They're not thinking about growth and development because if they really were, then uh, they would be thinking about how do you bring on that next generation. Yeah. And to do that, you have to be at work. Great. OK, thank you very much. Um, we'll move on to either um, Anne or Harley. It's uh, Harley for now, maybe Anne later. Um, <laughs> so I came here to this call thinking that uh, to this uh, meeting, thinking that I was going to be defending the office. But James has made me a bit worried now with all his comments on surveillance. He just reminded me 25 years ago as a junior, um, when I was working in an office, just this particular occasion, I had to ring up the head of the department to ask him something because he was working at home. Back then, only the bosses got to work at home as a privilege. Um, and he, you know, being a nice guy, he politely asked me how my day was going. And then he said, oh, I can see how your day is going because I've got, um, you're on the webcam in the office that I just installed yesterday. Uh, and I was a bit shocked and, uh, you know, the webcams were a new thing. Uh, and we all got him to take it down because we thought it was a bit outrageous. But then yesterday I saw a job ad for a company that was um, proudly proclaiming the fact that it has always on webcams in its offices, at least during normal non-COVID times. Um, so I don't know now, what do I think? Um, was I being naive? Is, is the office, uh, if the office is all about surveillance, what's so great about it um, anyway? Great. OK, thank you. Um, we'll move on to uh, Paul. OK, um, this is not directly aimed at Adam, but I think some of the things he was saying made me think about. I, I'm actually now in a position where for years and years we've kind of been ground down or concerned about office, office politics. I actually now am in a position where I feel I want to defend office politics. Um, just briefly, uh, during the lockdown, I worked at home for about 10 weeks and it was great avoiding the office politics. I had a project I could concentrate on. Then I moved back into the office and I realized I've missed off on lots of decisions they've made, et cetera, et cetera. And now I, I think about it, I am back in the office pretty much full time. But it's just the fact that when you're in an office as opposed to being on Zoom or whatever, you can see what people are doing. You can see cliques forming. You can see who's talking to who, guess, whatever, maybe cynically what's going on. But it makes me realise that office politics is, the positive side about it is you can see, you can see people jockeying for positioning careers, but also you see that you've got personalities clashing. And out of those clashes, a lot of it's negative, I guess. But there's positives coming out of it. People um, 
develop ideas, own ideas. They want to fight for ideas. So from that point of view, I, I, I kind of see a definite positivity that I don't, I can't see being um, replaced through technology. And the, the last final point of it is the, the thing about being in the office and being in this like milieu of office politics is it's gr you need it's great because at the weekend you can kind of forget about it and move away from it. So I think this is maybe tying into a bit of what Para was talking about with the private public. And finally, just briefly, and I'm a bit disappointed James didn't have a clocking in clock uh, in his, his pictures, but where I work, they've got fingerprint check-in, right? So working from home, I thought, great, I don't have to do, use my fingerprint to check in. But now the negative side of these technologies is they're, they're, they're likely to bring in a, a system where you can fingerprint check-in, but from your, um, your, your mobile phone. So, you know, there's definitely a negative aspect and this is like kind of soft soft monitoring as opposed to keyboard checking or something like that but i suppose my point is there are downsides to these technologies that come through as well okay brilliant thanks uh paul i think facebook have already said that they're looking at some kind of uh remote fingerprint uh for their uh office um workers um okay we'll move on to martin and then daniel and then i'll come back to the panel hi martin Hi. Um, so I uh, previously thought, right, we, we all need to be back in the office because, you know, call me old fashioned like others, I guess, you know, human contact is the way to go. You know, true. But then I was on a debate with someone uh, debating this very same subject a couple of weeks ago and, um, you know, it made me think uh, in, pre in preparing for it as well and talking to other people that, you know, why is it a lot of people are so keen to kind of get out of the office, even though there's lots of caveats? Uh, about it is because I think that if you look at say I think it's YouGov or Gallup they do a poll every year which alludes to what um, Para is talking about about employee engagement most employees surveyed hate their jobs they can't stand them and actually one of the reasons they hate them so much is because their managers are crap it's always comes up in the survey so it's, it's paradoxical because I think people actually kind of like working from home because they can get out of their horrible office situation or banter that Paul talks about and have some degree of freedom but equally because perhaps unlike certain generations they don't really feel their job no longer kind of rules their life their job is just a job and they can then escape uh go to their local park and listen to the sings bird birds sing and all the rest of it uh, uh and so i think that the problem with this debate is it's you know it's not necessarily about covid it's rather that we have to look at why work is as it is, uh, uh, predominantly because of, say, managerialism and, uh, you know, uh, sort of excessive amounts of trying to encourage people to collaborate when they don't want to and the rest of it. And I think it's the nature of work we've got to really look at and the nature of why companies are organised the way they are. Um, and one last thing, which is quite funny because, you know, my job is actually digital workplace technology, so I'm supposed to help people work remotely and all the rest of it. And someone I was debating with the other week actually said that technology also makes us free in the way that it's very inclusive because you can work at home and uh, you can in effect become, you, you know, you can be a shy person. And he's, he quoted his Myers-Briggs uh, uh, um, tribute and say, well, actually, you know, I'm a kind of a shy extrovert. And because we're all sort of more leveled out, uh, uh, you know, working remotely, we don't have to be physically in the office. It's less oppressive, you know, it's more inclusive. So I thought that was a really intriguing point because it's also a sign that how work is becoming a very psychologically understood thing. So I just wonder if Para especially can comment on that because I see the, the psychology of work sort of invading yeah. so much of this debate. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Martin. And uh, Daniel. Okay, I, I've just got a question which I'd be interested in hearing uh, from any of the panellists on, which is what is the balance you would put on between the commonality of these experiences people have talked about. So for example, people have made the point that working from home blurs the boundary between public and private, which I'm sure is right, and which applies to anyone uh, working from home. And the differential side of it, in other words, working from home, as some people have alluded to, can be a very different experience. So for example, if you're lucky enough to have a real uh, office in your home, it seems to me a very different experience from if your home office is the kitchen table or your bedroom, if you're living in a one bedroom flat. It seems to me to be a different experience if 
uh, you're a supervisor and a senior worker, and if you're a more junior employee, there's also probably a, a, an increasing number of people who are not necessarily unemployed, but underemployed and working from home. So they may have in the past worked 25, 30, 40 hours a week, now perhaps working far fewer hours a week, but they're still technically working from home. So what weight would people put on those, those differential sides of the equation? Great, thank you very much, Daniel. Um, well, I'll come back to the speakers now. I'll do you in reverse order? So, Dave, if um, if you can, you just pick up on one one point that you, or perhaps two, but very briefly, because we've got lots of people to come back out to. So, Dave, some great points made. Uh, I'll try and come back on uh, just a couple of them. Then, um, I think Martin was onto something when he talks about the uh, this notion of people hating their jobs and um, wanting to escape. Uh, from what he, what he described as the, the horrible office situation. I, I think there's something in that, but I don't think it's about the office as such. It's, a, it's about people's experience of work. It's about how they make sense of their working lives and how, how, it, um, how it fits into the, to, to their kind of motivations and you know, this kind of psychological aspect um, that somebody, somebody mentioned earlier on. So I think it's, it's, it's not necessarily to do with working from home. It's just that working from home, as Martin says, provides this opportunity to, to get out of that situation. Um, which is why I'm kind of a little bit skeptical about what, what Sally said about the importance of this notion of physically owning your desk and being part, you know, having that kind of that artifact there that you can say is yours. I don't think people on the whole are necessarily like that anymore. I put it on a, uh, on a par with people no longer having vinyl or CD collections and being happy to download their music. I don't think that's necessarily the case anymore for most people. Um, but I do think that there's aspects of the office that can't be replaced, which is something that Paul said, um, and that it's very difficult to reproduce. So it seems likely to me that what we're going to find is that people will um, float around um, you know, this, this notion that James came up with, the, the, this porous office, that you know, there'll be an element in which you know we'll have somewhere to go for meetings we'll have somewhere else to go to to um, meet with colleagues but we'll also be spending time at home i think that's likely to be what happens as we try to make the most of um these different um experiences but you know as i said you know in my introduction i think that the key point is that we're not in control of this at the moment this is something that's been foisted upon us so i think yeah. that you know that that's something that we need to kind of keep in mind whenever we're having these discussions Great. Okay. Thanks very much. Adam. Well, I'd like to carry on uh, from a couple of the points Dave made, and then I'll try my best to answer Daniel's question. First of all, um, Dave mentioned uh, people download and stream music and the record and the CD is largely niche, a thing of the past for most. <clears throat> the city and the office experience, the commute, is a bit like the music industry in the late 1990s. And I'm talking about the pre-COVID um, reality. People are becoming increasingly atomized, increasingly distant from their workplaces because they can't afford to live near them. And so they're getting less and less out of the city experience and less and less out of the workplace experience as a result. Um, Napster was a bit to the music industry what COVID has been, or I should say the political response to COVID. COVID's just a virus, politics is a bloody plague. Uh, but the response has been similar in that when the music industry was thrown what they call a curveball, uh, they, they didn't know how to respond. And so they thought, well, let's just sue everyone and ruin people's lives. And, and you know, it was sort of, they wanted to put Napster under a lockdown. but. People rebuilt and now legal streaming and downloading is the way to go. I think that resisting the work from home uh, scenario, this new reality is a bit like the equivalent of saying, oh, streaming music, it's just for the kids and it, there's no way to make it legal anyway. Pe people said that in perfect serious, as, seriousness as recently as 2001, uh, but we all know now where that went. And the other issue, which I, I believe was Martin who mentioned it, I do think that there is a case to be made that working from home will help to rebalance things back in favor of a meritocracy. Because when things are submitted digitally, rather than face to face, there's less of a chance that someone could be prejudiced against someone on a personal basis. Uh, let's just throw the cob, let's say someone has bad body odor, but they're a bloody good accountant. Well, 
pro that's one problem solved. And in an era where we're seeing now the, the, the new racialism of the woke, which is just as sinister as the old racialism of the past, um, again, it's all the more reason why something that looks at the results rather than the process of the work, I think is a positive thing on many levels, even if we didn't have this weird sociological movement going on on the new left. Yeah. Um, uh, just, just finally, you have to uh, on, answer Daniel's question. I think that, or at least to attempt to, I think that we're getting into an era where rather than trying to resist the inevitable, we've got to make the inevitable work for us. In other words, wouldn't it have been great if the music industry said, let's try to defend the artists that we've been screwing over so badly for 20 years in order to stop big tech from screwing us. And now look at it, now you've got, it's a bit like the John Cleese uh, class thing where you've got the tech companies and the top hat, you've got the record companies very diminished in their bowler hat, and then you've got the artists in the flat cap just as they've always been getting the thin end of the wedge. I think we should grasp this opportunity to say, look, People like working from home for objective reasons. We hate corona authoritarianism for both objective and philosophical reasons. And we need to make this work for us. I don't know where the trade unions are on this. You would think that they would be the first to say, we've got a point again in a big way for the first time perhaps since the 1980s. And I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm not a trade unionist myself, but I think that they really could have a lot to say. Instead, they're a bit like everyone else, they're acting like the music industry was in the late 1990s when they thought that they could sue and bully their way into immortality. We all know how that worked out. Brilliant. Thanks, Adam. Uh, para. As it happens, Adam, I think Francis O'Grady, the secretary of the uh, TUC, is actually arguing for flexible working to be, um, uh, should be a day one right and is arguing to change the, to the government to change the law. Um, very quickly on a couple of points. Daniel's point, um, the balance. I'm for choice, but I am here putting a positive case for why people should work uh, in the office for all the reasons I mentioned, togetherness, the sociability, all sorts of things. Uh, I'm arguing that the primary place uh, of work should be outside. Uh, it doesn't mean people can't choose to work um, from home. Um, I want to comment on Sally's point about um, older generation. Um, I've actually seen surveys where uh, apparently the older generation uh, would like everyone to go back to the office. And I've seen read surveys where the older generation, uh, because they've got more room and space, would prefer to stay at home. I think it's valid to worry about what is going to happen to the future generation. And I think it kind of feeds in into my point about recruitment. Uh, I don't actually buy that uh, employers have given up recruitment. My own company has just been given the go ahead to recruit a hundred people. Uh, and the whole question of, uh, you know, how do you uh, onboard them? Uh, and clearly onboarding them giving them the experience that older generation have um, uh, or you know, senior people, uh, experienced people have is quite an important one. Uh, so I think uh, it's another uh, important thing to understand why we should actually work uh, at the office. Very quickly on uh, ha Harley's point about the office is about surveillance. I mean, I think if we, uh, you know, and I'm not saying uh, no to anything that James has argued, uh, but I kind of think that if we, uh, if the office is about surveillance and working from home, you haven't seen anything yet. I already know of employers who are monitoring uh, people at home uh, through having their computers buzz uh, to alert them that they have to, you know, open their computers and work. So I think the whole surveillance that managers have to introduce or bosses have to introduce is definitely going to be on the increase if working from home is the new norm uh, and yeah. we're looking at a whole world of a different uh, scale altogether. Okay, thanks very much, Para. That was great. Uh, James? Just to reply to Harley, the, um, it's easy to think surveillance is to do with technology. This is Jeremy Bentham's panopticon for surveilling whole prisoners 
in a big block with just one man. And there's a long history of, of that. But in fact, as we know from the COVID crisis, surveillance isn't all about CCTV and all of these things. It's about your neighbors. It's about other people. It's about busybodies. And generally, it's interesting that surveillance was given a big outing, uh, surveillance at work, was given a big outing by Vance Packard back in 1964. But if you look at the trendy book that was just published last year, very much endorsed by The Guardian, there's no mention by Shoshana Zuboff of surveillance at work in the whole 500 page book or thereabouts. So the point I was trying to make about the Cold War office, and in my summing up, I'll bring it up to date if I may, is that, uh, you know, it's other people and the display of yourself uh, and the constant supervision it isn't the same as high tech surveillance. That is the important point. Mm -hmm. Obviously, in the home, you're going to have to rely on IT, but IT is not a condition for supervision and surveillance. And okay. in fact, as I've said, the neighbors and other forces will be inspecting your home as part of the employer's jurisdiction over your work. James, thank you. That's great. Uh, and I'll come out to Linda Murdoch next, please. Hi, my husband's just done the tech for me. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to make, I, I wanted to make another point, but basically the discussion has really led me to, to make this point. I mean, I think the, the whole point about surveillance in the workplace and the way the people, the reason why people are anti-surveillance is because they don't want to be judged. And I think they don't want to be accountable. Um, and I think that this is what this whole discussion is about um, and why people are so reluctant to come back to work. Um, the people in my work who have been trying desperately to get back to work are those who um, do not really, uh, can't reconcile themselves to the cut and thrust of the office life where you have to put yourself on the line, uh, you know, you have to problem solve, you have to put your judgments out there and be judged and they are the most reluctant to come back. Um, and so this whole thing about the borders between work and home life are really about the borders between judgment and non-judgmentalism. And the retreat into home life uh, is really very much about that. Paradoxically, which is what Power points out, is that we find that intrusion into our private life absolutely exhausting because we've got no space um, which to, to deal with our conscience and deal with our thoughts so that we can actually go out there into the public sphere, into work and, and make these judgments. Um, so I don't know what the answer is. Uh, I think that uh, the work from home thing is here to stay, but I still think it's really important that we have a private life and a public life and that we actually address this question of judgment and why people do not want to be judged. Great, thank you very much. Uh, I'll move on to Jagdish, but that's perhaps one people can think about in their summing up. Well, a question I had for James was that he, he in his uh, very interesting presentation, he was describing how changes were happening. <coughs> there were certain things happening and then other things happened and so on. What was the driver for all those changes? <coughs> and is that driver still there? Um, I'm the, I worked in local government for many years and it was well known that of a seven hour day, working day and on average people were doing about four four and a half hours worth of work and that was a good working day uh, whereas I know that when people are working from home they're literally going to be working seven out of seven hours because now there are a lot of sophisticated ways in which managers can get performance information about from either keystrokes or periods of inactivity and so on from the keyboard or even monitoring with the camera, et cetera. There are a lot of sophisticated products out there, which people will hear a lot more about. And so if you like surveillance will be there, but the problem is it's gonna be the same problem for the managers because they've also been working four and a half to five you know, hours a day. And they don't wanna work seven hours a day because they're gonna be, you know, they're not gonna like it either. So I think okay. we're at the, in the cusp of the situation where things are about to kind of change. And some of these changes have been happening for quite a while you know, about working from home. Because at the end of the day, with a lot of people, when they've got tight budgets, accommodation costs are a very large percentage of uh, a budget of an organization. And if they can shave that off and get increase their profitability, they're all gonna jump at it. And I think that was driving quite a lot of change from local government and central government 
towards get, working from home, uh, yeah. hot desking and all those kind of things. Uh -huh. The last thing I want to say is, you know, quickly tracked it. Okay, a lot of people, you know, when they look at kids, it's so on social media, they always whinge and say, oh my God, you know, these kids, they're not talking face to face, what's going to happen to them, etc. And I think this is the adult version of that, is that we are having a cus getting accustomed to a change which has been imposed, which is due to happen, but which has been imposed by the, by the uh, pandemic, and we're all going to have to get used to it. And once 5G is in place, uh, I think, you know, just wait for that, because then the whole virtual office environment will become a lot more different than people might think. So I think it's, Thanks, it's just, you've got to have a bit of confidence, just, just things will there. work itself out. Brilliant, thank you. Okay, we'll move on to you and now. Can Hi there, you... thank you. Yeah, great. I th yeah, I just wanted to, um, just worth just considering the context of the day and obviously many of us are working from home um, to protect our health. And it, it, it strikes me as um, important to think about the impact working from home does have on our health and is the negative uh, implications um, perhaps greatest for those who are in the lowest pay, paid jobs working from home? Because I think working from home is all about your home. So what's your home like? Who do you live with? What's your community like? And getting away from that and going into a city centre can often be an experience that is actually quite important to many people. Um, if you don't have space for a desk in your home, then you're really going to have, you've got potentially the, um, the, the long-term aim of working from a kitchen desk or working from, you know, a, a small table in a bedroom or something like that. So I think that's really important. And also in, in line with the health implications, um, how does it impact people's identity and their humility. So if you're in a tough job and you're a mother, a sister, father, a, a brother, and you have to defend yourself in front of your boss, um, in front of potentially your family who are in the same room, um, that's gonna take a real toll in your, your well-being. Perhaps that's something that those who are in lesser paid jobs might have to deal with. So I just would um, uh, like the panel to reflect on that and to um, come back with their thoughts. Yeah, that's really interesting you and I think a lot of us have different personas at work and at home. Um, brilliant. Okay, uh, we'll move on to Paul. Hi, thanks a lot. Um, my question for the panel is, um, how can the case for uh, the office be made in an age when people are more used to fragmentation and a lack of private sphere than maybe ever before? Um, I know a lot of young people find talk with private spheres kind of old fashioned, they don't really think it has any relevance to them. Um, and also as to why people prefer working at home, I know from people entering the workforce for the first time that they basically prefer it because uh, it's easier. Um, this is just from my conversations, but they seem to sort of relish the fact that they don't have to have that social anxiety of meeting new people and uh, sort of integrating themselves in new communities. And it, it doesn't really seem to me to be a good idea that we should indulge this tendency to uh, sort of not want to engage in those difficult situations where you might have to develop new social skills, especially for a young generation which suffers more mental health problems than maybe any generation before. So it seems like a recipe for just making that all worse. Um, thank you. Thanks very much, Paul. That was really well argued. Uh, Sheila. Hello. Hi. Um, a, a question and some comments for all the panel, but maybe especially James, because he covered such a lot of the broad history. So what I'm struggling with is what really is substantially different now socially? What really is different? When I started work 35 years ago, I clocked in and out at Manchester Town Hall. I saw favourites and preferred employees progress and I joined them. I saw big cheeses. They, they, they didn't attend meetings. Um, they went to the city centre hotel after work and hatched deals. So I'm interested in this idea of the paranoia that there may be, which I think um, if I was young in this sort of environment, I would certainly be paranoid about my future because I was a kind of social animal. So the online meeting is as delusional as the actual work meeting was before. 
the office cliques and the office politics are always present. So might there be a new currency of physical contact? You know, if you're invited to have an actual <coughs> off offline meeting, this is going to have greater value. I would certainly um, be paranoid if I was having seven hours of online meetings a day and none of the decision makers I was involved with was asking me for a side conversation. So, you know, in a world where there's going to be great redundancies, being out of sight and out of mind and listening to the birds yeah. would worry me a lot. Brilliant, actually, uh, Sheila. Thank you very much. Look, we've got eight hands raised. I think if everybody keeps it quite brief, we'll probably be able to get through them. I'm going to take down to Phil and then go back to the panel. And um, what we'll do is we'll leave the chat on for an, an extra half an hour after half past eight. So if you don't get a chance to speak now, uh, come and have a, a, a chat in the pub, Zoom pub afterwards. So OK, I'll move on to, uh, to Karen, please. Um, just uh, a point on technology. Um, Google has announced in the last couple of days that rather than advising um, people to work at home if they want to, um, they're actually going to be repurposing their offices. Um, so that people can on site, so that people can get together in clusters and groups and they can go in together and, and work together when they want to. Um, I had a couple of young people, very young people working for me on my team um, who were very, very tech able and just what Paul described as the sort of young people who might not want to be faced with this sort of big office environment where they have to socialize with lots of different people. And for the first 10 days of working from home, they spent all of their time on the telephone to Auntie Karen um, because they could not handle not being in a team environment because their, their whole re reassurance came from being around more experienced members of staff, um, sharing jokes and information and, 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 and all that kind of stuff. And the second thing, um, this is the thing that really concerns me, is that usually when decisions are made in business, it's because there's a purpose in business. It's an organic evolution and change is made because it's going to improve the way that we do business. Um, and I think there's quite a lot of doubt about whether working from home is actually, you know, the sort of um, and whether we've got the tech, um, whether we were headed that way. Um, whether it's actually going to Im improve the way that we do things in business in terms of productivity. Um, Google had said that their productivity was down. Um, so that change hasn't been organic. Um, just because we've got the technology and can work out, how, we, we've got to work out how it's going to increase our business performance. Um, and I think a lot of people, there's a, a gap between people feeling the need to stay at home and, and work from home because they're protecting their health um, and actually how it's going to work out in the long run. I think there's a big gap between their belief that actually this is something which is going to be good for them as employees and for their business, the fact that they do a job because they want to succeed, um, yeah. rather than the fact that they don't actually have belief in the reasons that we're doing it, which is they don't have confidence in the decisions that the government is making. Um, so this sort of this, um, continually um, firefighting um, is... Is, is, is not actually inspiring confidence in okay. working from home, which could actually be good. Thank you, Karen, and uh, good luck finding a job very soon, I'm sure you <laughs> will. You. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll move on to Monica. Uh, as a social historian, I just wanted to um, mention something that I don't think anybody has mentioned before. In this country, certainly, we always used to work from home until the Industrial Revolution came along. And it was a patriarchal decision for men to go out to the city and work and for women, the angels of the house, to stay inside in the privacy of the home and keep it clean. In fact, they would have very heavy curtains in the window because they wanted to separate the two domains. Um, and in fact, I think also part of it was an attempt, if we're talking about surveillance, to stop the women knowing what the men were doing outside. So it was a patriarchal decision and it was a, a, a male construct, the office, uh, whereby men could uh, do what they wanted in the privacy of being on their own without women. Great, thank you. We'll leave it there um, because we want to try and catch, but that's a point well made. Frankie, next please. Um, just following on from Cowers, Karen's points as well um, is just looking at I think the temptation with Zoom and Teams when you're not physically in the room with them is 
is I can't be the only one who does this, but leaves the phone on the corner and then goes and does some washing up or loads the the washing machine. And I do wonder how the workplace, um, how the move towards kind of internet and working from home is just going to close the mind of those people because you're not forced to have interactions um, in the workplace to challenge ideas and so that um, ideas that perhaps would have been destroyed in a meeting previously with everyone working in their own little um, working from home in their own little alienated bubble those ideas aren't going to be thrashed out and I do wonder about the consequences for business um, of individuals rather than this kind of um, cooperative decision making. Brilliant. Thank you, Frankie. Uh, we'll move on to Bridge. Hi. Um, I think it was you and talked about the effect of uh, work on health. And obviously, this is something that employers have taken a uh, great interest in. And um, the discussions that have arisen in the uh, recently about employers um, monitoring or sorry uh, not allowing people to smoke from home is a new aspect of this concern that I think is quite worrying and I'm wondering what uh, panelists think about that should employers be able to determine what you do in your office uh, is the office belonging to you or to your employer and who determines uh, what happens there Thanks. Great. Thank you, Breeze. Uh, I'm going to go to Claire. Um, and when I come back to the panel, just to let you all know, speakers, I'll, I'll go in the order that we started. So I'll start with James and, and go that way. OK, Claire. Hi, everyone. I think that I'm probably with um, Parrot more. And I really liked what Linda had said. But I think that the most important thing for me is context on this. We're talking about it rather abstractly. The context is that we are in a culture of fear. And it seems, therefore, that most of the work uh, from home uh, argument has to be seen in the context of a real retreat from the public sphere. I mean, it's almost like a kind of, you know, got to remember that people have had the stuffing knocked out of them in many ways, and the public sphere is being taken away brick by brick. And so consequently, I can't be excited about the technological possibilities when I can see this context all around it. And it's also the case that people have asked about the trade unions. I mean, because I used to be a teacher, I've been dis dis in despair that the teachers unions, both the lecturers and school unions, have been arguing that people should stay away from work. And it's always been this kind of retreating atmosphere. And can I, you know, somebody just mentioned the patriarchy. Can I just, uh, a little bit of history, I, I, it's possible that Paul will think this is rather old fashioned, but anyway, let me say, women fought long and hard to get out the house, right? They got to get out of the home. And there was a good reason for that, which is the confines of the home were limiting, narrow, parochial, you weren't able to join the public sphere. So I don't want to celebrate that, even if I don't mind doing the odd Zoom call now and then. Um, you know, it's one thing that I've noticed, the Academy of Ideas does everything via Zoom. We have regular meetings, they're all very successful and it, we will carry on even after normal returns. But it is also true that when I, we actually get together face to face and have office meetings, we work we do far more work. We finish each other's sentences. It's more creative. It's different. It's real. And there is a real limitation. And there's also a sense in which every time I go to work, I hate getting up in the morning. I hate getting on the tube. I hate commuting. I hate all of it. I'd much prefer to stay here and do it via Zoom. But I also know that I become a different person in the process of that commute because I become a public person, not a kind of domestic uh, person. And finally, Dave Clements made a very important point. There's millions of people who can't work from home. Millions who've had to carry on. Their jobs do not allow it. And sometimes the work for home discussion does act in some major way of separating the world of work into those of us who can sit at home and work, and that's all fine. But what about the millions who can't? This discussion needs to bear in mind there's a danger of creating a real social uh, split here and uh, talking as though we can't even notice those millions of people who've got no choice but to go out to work. But as it happens, I think going out to work is something that we should all do myself. Yeah, okay, brilliant. Thanks, Claire. And then move on to Nikos. Um, well, two brief points. Uh, the first is that working from home is one scenario, but at least to solve the issue of not having to go on public transport, uh, 
there is a scenario of people working from satellite offices. So there are lots of workspaces that are meanwhile spaces. Um, we work obviously and associated outfits, uh, Regis and so on, who could or are presenting themselves as being a space where teams from your company could work privately connected to the main office, could have meetings in person and so on. Uh, and I think that's another scenario we need to think about working from home, taking Claire's point that not everyone can work, uh, you know, online uh, all the time. But I think there's another point here, and this is taking into account the issues of interpersonal relationships that Sheila has talked about and James' uh, points about uh, surveillance and work and so on, is actually there's been a, not very much innovation in the way in which we work remotely. And people may think that sounds odd, but 20 something years ago, James and I co-authored a publication together online entirely without meeting. Uh, and we were able to do that with the technology of the late 1990s. Uh, and the kind of possibilities that we could be using for collaborating remotely were demonstrated 50 years ago in San Francisco by Doug Engelbart of the Stanford Research Institute. We haven't even realized what they were doing in 1968. So we need a lot more innovation in the way in which we collaborate remotely, which means uh, full wall screen so we can see each other, being able to physically hand documents to one another over the internet, being able to escalate communications in natural ways, not the artificial ways we do. There's a whole panoply of possibilities that we need to be thinking about. So if we are working from home, we need a lot more innovation in that domain. Thanks, Nico. Uh, Phil. Thanks. Um... Well, I agree very much with the uh, various uh, contributors who stressed the social divisiveness of this discussion, because I think that's the most troubling aspect to me, both the way it reflects existing divisions and is reinforcing them. Uh, obvious divisions people have talked about between the, those who feasibly can work from home and those who can't in terms of their work task, uh, levels of uh, income and wealth in terms of those who got homes with decent internet connections and offices and so on, and those who don't. Uh, divisions in age between those who you know understand how work works and young people who who, who, who don't and uh, divisions between those who are experienced or not and all, all that it seems to me that if we're going to privilege work from home that's going to sort of reinforce all, the, all those divisions. Second point of, that flows from that is I think um, the the uh, uh, the very way in which this discussion is being viewed with generally in society not this discussion but the working from home discussion is being viewed with such a uh, positivity and enthusiasm is, I think, a very sad reflection on uh, what Claire just talked about, the retreat of the benefits of the public space. I mean, it seems to be one of the great, one of the great gains of society the last 200 years in the Industrial Revolution has been collective working, that working together collaboratively is uh, something which brings uh, not just economic benefit, but brings social benefit. I mean, whether it's from the standpoint of the employer, you know, trying to deliver their service or uh, uh, provide their good, or from the standpoint of the employees who, if they're atomized and isolated at home, don't have the scope for solidarity and for collective thinking and for collective uh, defense of their interests, whether their interests as individual and collective workers, or also in terms of being able to contribute to the outcome of that uh, uh, productive process. Uh, and it just is worrying just how you know, rapidly, uh, we've given up on that. I mean, just to, to, to illustrate that, we, we should remember that only a few years ago, uh, home working uh, was derided as a backward, uh, primitive, low productivity, static productivity, inefficient form working, the old cottage industries of the 19th century. Uh, the, the, the workplace, the collective workplace was seen as a huge advance upon that. And yet today we're very openly seeing as progressive something which uh, uh, was uh, uh, quite rightly condemned as being exploitative, super exploitative, atomizing and uh, socially and politically back and uh, socially and economically backward. Look, I think I'm going to have to go back to the panels. Uh, James, can we come to you? Well, just picking up from where I left off, I'll try to answer the questions. I mean, Claire and Phil are obviously right. I'm sorry I neglected uh, the culture of fear, um, but I think we do need to uh, understand just um, how the, the conventional office has never been great either. They're, they're both sites of exploitation and discrimination. But just since the women question has been raised, let me say that 
all these books from the late 60s and early 70s, as Claire said, they're all about getting out of the home and into work. And one of the interesting things about them is that that whole era, uh, some of the time, uh, like getting out of the home, people resisted sex role stereotypes, which have now come back, as we know. Um, but generally, women sort of gained a lot uh, by the end of the 70s and the 80s. That's why um, 9 to 5 was playing at the front of this whole thing, because they came into the workforce, they were often part-time, and they established a relationship where um, they were their own people. They were not the typists who actually accompanied the first origins of the uh, office. Well, women went to work in the office, very importantly, with the bicycle and the typewriter. But by the 80s, 1982, you'll see that they, uh, the dominant occupation of women was office occupations, 36%. And in that whole thing, their supposed sensitivity, their interpersonal skills, their reading of people, and that whole kind of surveillance uh, of, you know, in, interpersonally became more important. The final factor that made all of these things uh, significant for the office was what was happening with legislation in 1986. The upshot of all of this was that apart from the other forces making the open office uh, even more open, the project teams and this sort of thing was the egalitarianism, was there was a demand for transparency in the office because the home was seen as uniquely awful, always the site for abuse and so on. And therefore the big discussion in the office became that of transparency, even more openness, less nasty bosses like in nine to five. And it wasn't the corner office for status that was just the whole thing. It was now the glass ceiling. The final development in all of this, and then I'll stop, is that homeworking, as colleagues have said, begins to be theorized also in the 70s by this guy, famous book, and then by famously Alvin Toffler, 1980. And the most significant article, which very interestingly, you cannot get hold of on the Harvard Business Review, before the mobile phone, about 20 years before the iPhone, was this one, your office is where you are. It's really hard to get hold of. Why, I don't know. But in this whole period, through the 80s, and then on to the 90s, remote working itself began. It was a big deal. And Shoshana Zuboff, who I've already indicted over surveillance, started attributing magical powers to IT. So we I was- round up now, James. Now, when Adam said it was human beings, not a printing press that le led to Protestantism, it isn't IT that led to the uh, working from home and the invasion of private life. All of these things were going 30 years ago at British Airways and elsewhere, and it is one large piece of blancmange, which now includes, has long included working from home, and it is an infringement, not just of privacy, but of our ability to reflect, to think, to act, and be autonomous citizens for ourselves. That kind of intrusion, both in the main office and at home and at all intermediate locations, is going to be a big nexus for struggle in the next 10 years. Thanks, James. Uh, okay, if we move to um, uh, Para, please. Um, okay, uh, a lot of really interesting and good points have been made, and I will not have enough time here to go into any one of them in detail. So I'm going to end on giving you a positive case for the office, and it's something I've uh, read recently, uh, so I'm going to read it. It is not the sandwich you buy, it is the sandwich you buy with colleagues. It is the beer after work, the snatched coffee and gossip, the jokes with the person at the next desk. It is the accidental conversation that sparks an idea. For those glued to the kitchen table, bouncing from one Zoom call to another, this is a call to remember what we miss. And in one line, working from home means we will miss the spontaneity, the human interaction, and pretty much everything that makes us human. Working from home is a very isolated way of uh, being, if you like. Um, that's it. 
Thank you very much, Cara. That was lovely. Um, Adam. Right. Uh, I think my microphone's on now. There are several things that very much frighten me about what's going on in this country and beyond right now. And the demonition, not the abolition, but the demonition of the office isn't one of them. What frightens me is the loss of community that's been going on for far too long. We no longer frequent the pub round the corner. We no longer know the old lady in the house next door. We walk past the flower shop every day, even though the owner's struggling to make ends meet. We live a life, or at least we have done, where we go from home to train to gloss ugly modernist office block and back and of course there is a socializing in between which is the saving grace but i'm much more concerned about the loss of socializing at a local level and at a community level because it's the communities that give us our future it's our communities that look after the old that make the young grow up ethically and happily and if we lose that I think we lose a great deal and we have indeed been losing it for a very long time because of policy not because of technology I would argue right now that problem has been combined with a frightful loss of civil liberties the idea of choice has been replaced by the stick of conformity. The idea of freedom has been replaced by a kind of collectivism that would make the Stasi blush. And traditions that used to safeguard a liberty are now being replaced by a kind of new authoritarianism which seeks to make technology master us rather than us master technology. I'm not afraid of technology, and I never have been. Whenever technology and I don't get along, I blame myself, then blame the designer of the technology, but it doesn't go beyond that. But when it comes to the tech surveillance state, when it comes to losing our civil liberties, when it comes to creepy people like Mr. Cummings, who thinks that technology should be the master of human interactions, I have to go back to where we all started. Do not blame technology. Do not blame ordinary human, be human beings. Blame the new authoritarianism. Meet the new boss, same as the old boss. It's not a computer. It's not Zoom. It's those who wish to control other people under the penalty of law. That's always been the danger, and it is today. At least if we can use Zoom, maybe we can avoid the coming homeless crisis, which is going to be very, very bad. And I'm quite sad to have to say that, but it is sadly the truth. Great. Thank you very much, Adam. And uh, finally, Dave. Yeah, I suppose... Um... My final thoughts are, you know, so somebody mentioned uh, during, during the discussion that uh, employers, local government in particular, are so keen on working from home for their employees because it's a way of saving money. I think there's some truth in that. But I think their argument is, is more interesting. The argument they use is that it improves people's well-being, um, it makes their lives uh, uh, more balanced, and it gives them greater flexibility. But I think, as some people have already said, uh, Ewan talks about um, uh, the least well-off being the, the ones who tend to suffer most from working from home uh, uh, arrangements. Um, uh, you know, I think that's, that says kind of something about the lie of this notion that, that uh, being at home improves your well-being. Uh, and Bridge asked the question about uh, who owns the office if it's in your home. And that's another problem with this well-being notion. It, it kind of blurs that distinction between, you know, wh what is your space and what is your employer's space? So I think that's kind of the the... the, 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 the best argument we have against against working from home. But the best argument against the office is something that, that Martin mentioned in, in the discussion, and it's this idea that people hate their jobs. And, you know, we don't all hate our jobs, but a lot of people do. And I, I think this perhaps has something to do with the changing nature of work um, in terms of, you know, the kind of managerial, target-driven, soul-destroying nature of work in a lot of instances now. I think that in itself can kind of uh, have an impact on people's relationship with their work. Um, and so like, Linda talked about people wanting to escape this judgmentalism and Harley talked about the problem of surveillance. I think, you know, these might be different things, but I think, that, I think that's got something to do with it. The people's experience of work has become like that. Whether you're at, you're at home or in the office, you've got this sense that you're being watched, but it's difficult to take any meaning out of work. So, if, you know, I think that's something which, which we also need to consider. But ultimately, we have to demystify um, what working from home is all about. 
and we need to make the arguments for the kinds of things that we associate with going to the office even if we don't actually go to the office but we need to value the things that are important about it so um you know for, for me i think being at home disguise unemployment uh, frankly have people doing their washing up rather than doing their work but there, there is a sense in which you know you, you're not only unaccountable but you're also you know no one really knows what's going on you're kind of isolated um you're 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 you're, you're left to your own devices and that, that that kind of removes that sense of commitment that you might otherwise have. Yeah. It, Phil talked about solidarity and important solidarity. I think we tend to be locked away from each other, and that's that, that's a real problem. Claire talked about the process of going out and becoming a public person, almost as you travel out to the workplace. I think that's something we need to kind of keep in mind and to embrace that kind of social side of working and the importance of that. Whether we actually go physically or not to a workplace, we need to start embracing those ideas about why um, those old notions are important. Brilliant. Thank you, Dave. And Dave, while we've still got you, um, do you just want to, we're just about to wrap up now and uh, thank you to everyone. Uh, Dave, do you just want to um, give a little shout out for the Social Policy Forum, uh, of what, which tonight has been? Yes, of course. Um, yeah, the Social Policy Forum uh, runs uh, various discussions, sometimes on Zoom. And before that, we would meet up in a pub um, when we we're allowed to do that kind of thing. Um, and also at the uh, annual battle of ideas when 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 that was um, uh, meeting. So you know uh, we run discussions on a variety of things from social care, wealth, the welfare states, um, education, all the people's care. There's all sorts of different discussions that we have, and we try to get behind the headlines and uh, take a critical take on uh, uh, what broad trends are uh, in, in social policy. So if anybody's interested in coming onto these discussions. Uh, virtually or not um then uh, please let me know um and uh we'll be organizing a new one i'm sure within the next month or so great wonderful thanks very much dave uh just to say we are we also have another event i told you we don't stop working on uh monday evening um uh, adam mentioned uh civil liberties we will be talking about civil liberties in corona times and that will be seven o'clock uh, this coming Monday. So if you're not signed up for the newsletter, uh, please sign up for it. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, any donations to help our work, we are busy. Um, we do try and keep um, life alive as, as possible, discussion, debate, and some sense of uh, that kind of public coming together, that kind of public life as best we can. Um, you can, I think uh, my colleague Rob will put a link on to our events page, but do sign up for the newsletter where you can just drop me an email uh, and I will help you out. But uh, all that remains for me to do this evening is to thank everybody for coming. I know we've run on, so thank you to those of you who stayed right to the end. Some really, really fantastic discussions as ever. Those audience uh, questions and points really make these debates and a, a special thank you to our four wonderful speakers who really kind of provoked us to have such an interesting discussion in the first place. Um, I'm going to leave the chat on if anybody wants to, it, it will be um, not formal, uh, so you can unmute yourselves. In fact, if you want to unmute yourselves and give our speakers a round of applause, that might be quite nice. Um, <laughs> uh, and then, um, yeah.